Hello. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. How are you doing? Oh, oh wait, can you see me? Wait. No, it's okay. It's okay not to see you because um, it uses up my uh, internet. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, it's been a while. How are yeah, you? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Have you been away on work? Uh, no, actually, I was on a, um, a two-week meditation retreat in Temecula, which was quite lovely. Um, yeah. Yeah, very intense as well. What but, type uh, of meditation was it? Uh, it was Advaita. Um, it was, uh, so, you know, there was a little bit more of a social atmosphere than, say, a Vipassana retreat. Yeah. Um, you know, wine at dinner, that kind of thing. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it was it was absolutely lovely. And, you know, obviously I had the uh, the ability to just kind of go in and be, be alone and sit in a corner and uh, be a good meditator. So, and that's mostly what I was doing for the two weeks. Yeah. Um, and it was beautiful because I... Yeah, yeah, no, I just kind of discovered this silence, like, you know, the, the, the silence that's even around, you know, among words, right, and objects and that kind of thing, yeah. but um, it, yeah. it's kind of a, yeah, it's so much, I don't know, um, there's so much wisdom there, Yeah. you know, that is, you, you just, you just kind of stay there and things just unravel on their own, you know, and it just, it, like, things just kind of take care of themselves. In, a, in, a, in an interesting way. Yeah, that's really beautiful. Yeah. I like the way that you phrased it, like the silence that's around really long words. Yeah. <laughs> that's nice. Yeah. yeah, I think I, um, yeah, I hit you up though, because like you said something very interesting about, because uh, one thing that started coming up was also that love that you were uh, referring to, you know, the love of, well, the love that I am. Um, yeah, there, there's just been a very, like, clear, but maybe not consistent seeing of it, but, uh, I don't know, like, the, I don't, uh, uh, well, I don't know, I guess what, what I was noticing, at least this morning, was, you know, like, I, this tendency that also came from around uh, my school days was, was uh, a tendency towards unlovability, like, giving my, like, you know, finding any excuse to not, to feel unworthy of love, and, yeah. um, yeah, and it, it does feel like, yeah, just a personal tendency, but, uh, yeah. yeah, but my approach, I guess, and I just wanted to run it by you is just, just kind of, well, contemplating that non-dual love, you know, just, it, well, is there love that's ever present? Yeah. You know, and yeah. by that love? Yeah. Um, yeah, totally, totally. And that's, that's really what you've always been looking for. So as a kid, you got mistaken, like, so when you began to feel unloved on the human level, you thought the answer was, rather than just that feeling appearing, that experience appearing, you, you connected the dots unconsciously and thought that love was um, like um, getting to the... Um, hang on, I've got that back to front, actually. So when you were younger, I have to start again, I got confused then. When, when, you, were, <laughs> when you were younger, like you, your that trauma happened or that experience happened, so the feeling came up and said, "I'm not lovable," and then what you did was you remembered this love, this all-encompassing love, because we all know it, we all remember it, we all have a, a taste of it. It's the sense of I am, it's the sense of being, and it's there in all experience. But then what your mind did was your mind mistakenly thought that that unconditioned love comes from being accepted by people, being loved by people, by, be, by being not rejected by people. And then that seeking loop happens, and then this is when the person begins to get in suffering. So it's not actually the initial feeling. So say if you, you have parents that don't give you attention, or you're in a circumstance where your partner no longer loves you anymore. It's not that that's inherently the problem. That is a pain that arises in your heart area, and that that connects to your childhood, like not being loved enough by the parents. So it's like a vibration of pain. And it's just a, a pain that's happening. But then the mind takes hold of it. And the mind isn't really conscious of that. And then it desperately tries to seek from for love from that partner, like it can't let go of that partner, it holds on to it and it becomes like um, an addiction. And it's just a cross belief that you believe that environments are going to fulfill you and situations are going to fulfill you. They never will fulfill you, ever. They will come and go, like all feelings. 
And then what we also get to in non-duality is we get to this point where we think that we'll become totally unconditioned and that's when we'll be loved. We'll stop having yeah. feelings and that's when we'll be loved. Whereas actually it's right here in your, in your experience, that love, it's that, that I am, it's that sense of being. But sometimes it can be heavily masked because there's lots of like seeking energy or discomfort energy, so you can't touch that. Mm -hmm. Non-duality or, or um, becoming unconditioned becomes the new game. So you're always waiting to get over something, you're always waiting to not feel a certain feeling or to experience a certain thing or to have a particular reaction. I'm waiting, I'm waiting. I see, I, I might be... Yeah, I feel like I might be stuck in a little bit of a self-improvement game in that way. You know, I see the unlovable tendency and like, well, clearly I can't feel or I can't be the love until this thing goes away. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but no, the love is here regardless. Yeah, it's that sense of, of I am, it's that sense of being. Yeah. And, it, and it's just, it can be a strong tendency, these things. So it's like um, when you go out of the house, if people look at you a certain way, maybe you feel suddenly unlovable and it quickly brings up that shame in your body and your body closes down. And then through that closing down, then the mind quickly goes into that story and then begins to think, if I didn't feel this, if I could release it, I've got to release it. Whereas actually, so the body's closed down, the feeling's closed down, but your, your sense of being is still expanded, is still everywhere. And even that feeling that's closed down is actually everywhere. It also isn't limited anywhere. It just it feels like an idea, it's actually life or God, or everything that's holding that feeling. It just feels like it's yours. It feels like it belongs to you, and that there's a certain you inside the body, and this you is going to get somewhere. But there's never been the existence of you. It doesn't mean that you don't spend time getting to know that feeling, because, like, staying like not being afraid of that feeling is, is it in a way, like not trying to get away from it. So just feeling that burn in the heart chakra when you feel unloved, when you feel put down. It's nice feeling it in the context, though, of, um, I don't know, the context of non-duality, if I can say it like that. Yeah. Just, uh, it allows that clench to kind of move and open. so beautiful so just sitting in silence like i'm happy for you that you did this retreat it's so beautiful just sitting yeah yeah no that's that's yeah that really is the beauty of retreat it's um and i don't know like the uh the temptation because it's yeah again like it's not a vipassana style retreat there's a very social atmosphere and it's um the temptation in that context can be like when I really should be like, how do you say? Yeah, like you said, becoming familiar with say this very, very intense emotion of unlovability. Uh, maybe I'd rather just seek love from the people around me. Yeah. You know? <laughs> that seems like a much easier, you know, but uh, I don't know. Yeah. At some point, my teacher just kind of like, 
Uh, she like she just very bluntly said, "You're not here to socialize." Uh, you know, <laughs> I'm like, "Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, you're right." <laughs> you know, and I uh, no, and I'm and I'm very thankful um, that I was able to yeah just sit with it and um, <sighs> I found that a lot. There's actually a lot of um, yeah, the unlovability is not just, uh, yeah, I feel like it, it kind of permeated a lot of aspects of my life. Yeah. Um, you know, like I think the inn was kind of a, a romantic uh, breakup, actually, you know, not, not to beat around the bush, but like I started to see the unlovability, like when I started to become familiar with it. Oh, it's, it's also career, lifestyle, um, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, just... <laughs> I started, yeah. Yeah, it does. These uh, karmas affect all areas of our life. Mm. Like every, uh, like all of us, like a, like a, we're like machines. So if you've been taught, often as a child, that you're not lovable, then it's then your body is programmed to seek and to look for that. Mm. Yeah, in many aspects of life, I guess. Yeah. And in a way, like you could see it all as like a gift because ev all of these things are, are what make you grow in the end because you have to overcome them in order to, to survive in this society. Otherwise you fall down and others eat you or you get killed. Mm. Uh, sorry, that, that last part was uh, a bit choppy. What was that uh, the last few? I said, um, I said, like if you don't, if you don't like overcome these mountains or these hurdles or your personality structure then you fall down and you get killed you get eaten by others you you can't make this life like this life is always asking you to expand and grow from your shortcomings that's the gift of it yeah yeah no absolutely and um yeah and the fact that you know yeah when you get to how do you say, or when I start fooling myself, you know, when I start like putting myself in this kind of fake, non-dual, peaceful place, you know, suddenly God will just kind of throw something, <laughs> throw something at me like, oh yeah, yeah, okay, I'm bullshitting. I was yeah. bullshitting myself. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes my teacher would like, when I'd start like talking, you know, like kind of the non-dual bullshit, you know, it's all, it's all one and love and there's nothing to peace here. And she's like, oh, that's really good. How's, uh, how's your career going? <laughs> oh, shit. And then I just kind of realized like, oh, okay. Yeah, it's still stuck. It's still stuck. Bullshit. <laughs> how's your career going? <laughs> Silence. <laughs> yeah, <Yep>, clutch up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hello. Hello. I'm still here. <laughs> you you what? I'm still here. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Do you hear a tapping every time I move? Uh, I, 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 that's what I thought I heard. I, I, it was, uh, yeah, and I thought, oh, wait, is it, and, you know, it kind of sounded like, uh, you know, sometimes when the reception gets bad, so that's what I thought happened. It's actually my earrings. 
um, cat tapping ah, against yeah. the microphone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I forget that because when it's my other microphone, but I think that you're hearing through. I don't know what microphone you're hearing through. I think you're hearing through this one, and then it, you hear the tapping through the um, headphone one. Yeah, it's interesting. We, because um, there is kind of a clench in the chest, but there's still a there's a pull towards the you know towards the space now. It's almost it's it's funny. They're kind of existing in the, at the same time. Yeah. Get... Yeah, like what we think is we think it's open, like that it's our body open. So it's all your feelings in a state of pleasure. And often when we have these awakening experiences, our body is in a state of pleasure. But you can actually have tightness in your torso and you can be expanded. You can be infinite. Yeah. So, so what our mind is subtly doing is it's always rejecting negative feelings and negative karmas. And it's the opposite of what, it's not that should be done, but it's the opposite. Like I can't think of a better word than saying should. But what... what the way to handle it is to totally embrace the negative and to totally accept that on the human level we have karma and yes we can expand from that karma and we can change that karma but it's also deeply embedded in our genetic history and our DNA and our body has to have karma in order to respond but you can have this like huge infinite space with all of that response happening and and you've got to like I always think it's polite to work on your shit. Like that's the polite human thing to do, like the ethical human thing to do is to like work on like on your karma, like so see your karma. So when you're in relationship to someone, you can see when your karma is getting overexcited and being too dominant or too controlling or too bossy or too whingy or too, too whatever it is. So you can see that and you don't have to keep acting it out with people. You can act like... To an extent, the karma is going to be acted out. You can't help it, but you don't have to keep like acting out very difficult scenarios again and again and again. Like you can catch them and you can move away from them. But in all, but but the, also, you can be free in all of that. There can be this massive expansion happening. Wow, the human is being a human. And that was radical for me, you know. When Roger, like Roger, was one of my teachers, and when he. Um, would say that you could be, uh, I was so, I used to get so angry at him because he, he would say that you could experience anger and be free. I'd be like, it would just make me so mad, like him saying that and one day we were walking through the forest and, um, and he was annoying me by saying this and I began to get angry and then suddenly I, like, I had this huge expansion and then I was angry simultaneously and I was like, no shit, oh yeah. You can be both. <laughs> you can be both. What does change is the seeking energy. Though that spiraling out of control, like that, that seeking energy. And that can be something that like changes instantly or it can change and dissipate through time. That that like pattern of thinking that if I don't get angry or if somebody loves me then I will be fulfilled by that and, and, and what you're unconsciously believing is that fulfillment will be that love that I am your true essence and then you never get there so that's what dissipates and changes hmm. well I and mean, I suppose that when the seeking energy goes like this unlovability probably won't have much of a much ground to stand on either Um, the seeking for that, but if you've been taught, so if you were brought up in like a really abusive um, home where you were told that you are unlovable, like so your assumption is to put yourself below other people, energetically you might still do that. Energetically you might still feel like you're lower than 
other people, like energetically, just like in a dog pack where, um, you know, you've got all the different levels of dogs. Like you've got the runt dog and then you've got the like um, top dog, the medium dog, like you've got all the different levels. So um, like So your personality might t- still tend to respond in, in that way. So say if your partner doesn't call you for a few days or doesn't respond to you, you might begin to get a burning in your chest. And then when you really go into it, you might realize that you feel unloved. And then you can trace that back to your childhood when you felt unloved. So there might still be the tendency there. But it won't be like it was before, dictating your whole life. But you, you'll notice like, like a, sh- uh, a shadow or like a ghost still there, the patterns of the human. So if you say, if you take away unlivability, because that's quite an emotive topic. And if you say anger, so say when you were younger, your older brother always used to um, steal things from you and, and cross your boundaries. And so when people don't return your stuff or don't respect your stuff and anger arises, that doesn't necessarily have to go. You still might, as an adult, even knowing this freedom, have a tendency to be protective over your stuff. But what our mentality is, as humans, is to always be radical about everything and think, I'm going to become totally unconditioned and my whole past is all going to disappear and I'm never going to get reactive and I'm never going to act out of past things again. And if I do, that means I'm not enlightened. Whereas actually they're simply feelings that arise from a pattern of behavior that you've experienced as a child. So if we take it to Khaleesi, to me, Khaleesi, my dog is totally free. Um, but she, she can, when it's me and her, she actually has very easily easy conditioning. But when it's just me and her, we've got our routine and it's really easy. And when, she, and when somebody else comes in the house that she knows, it's also really easy. But when somebody comes in the house that she doesn't know, it's really complex. So when, when we're in scenarios that, like, so say being on a retreat, like I don't have anyone that can look after her, so I often have to take her on my retreats. And Khaleesi cannot stand strangers touching her. And it's, and it's my fault, like I've known her since she was a baby. She wasn't always my dog. She was a street dog for the first six months of her life. And she used to come to my talks. I used to do talks in Thailand, and she used to come to the talks. And she, she's always been quite a shy dog from, from when I um, got her, she was quite shy. But what people used to do is everyone used to come to the talk and they always used to want to stroke her. And she didn't like it. And she um, felt uncomfortable with it. And I should have stopped people doing it, but I didn't actually notice because I was busy doing the talk. <laughs> and I should have stopped people like touching her. But what happened to her through those six months is that people kept crossing her boundaries. So eventually she, she would begin to growl at people. And she, you know, when they would touch her and pull her around, she'd begin to growl at them. And if I'd been aware, I could have seen these, um, this and, and told people that she doesn't like being touched. She's a shy dog. She's a quiet dog. And so now she from that and from also taking her to lots of lots of my retreats and people always um, wanting to touch her, she now has a response. If people, strangers go to touch her, then she can sometimes growl or bark at them because that's her, that's her way, that's the way that she's learned that she's successful at getting people not to touch her. And now I know the story as to why that evolved because I, I didn't really know she was my dog at the first six months. I didn't really attempt to train her. Like she lived on my balcony, but it wasn't like I was, it wasn't like, oh, she's my dog. She, she became my dog. Um, and also I was doing the talks. I didn't really notice that people were coming and invading her space. And, um, and I could have either, I could have either locked her away or I could have told her that she had to go down in the jungle or in the forest, or like away or, away at that time, but I didn't really notice. So I just let that happen. And then over time, when people kept not, when people kept invading her, she then got a habit to be a little aggressive with people if they tried to touch her that she didn't know. If she knew them, she was fine. And now that stays with her. So I can see how that's happened and I can see how that conditioning happened. 
she's not a bad dog or an ag aggressive dog. I don't see her like that. Other people would say that's aggressive or bad dog. But I see how that pla that panned out. And I see my my problem in it. Like I didn't, and I still don't do it on retreat. I'd still, when I first came back to Europe, I didn't do it enough on retreats because I was too busy doing the retreat. It was too much to think about and people kept invading her. And and so now she she has this response to people. So you could say that's the same. You've been trained as a child to respond, to believe that people don't like you or people don't love you when you interact with them. Just like Khaleesi's been trained to believe that humans don't respect her boundaries. Like as a dog fan, I, I know that you shouldn't touch a dog you don't know. Like I, I know, I know that, like I know a lot of dogs are friendly because they've been trained to be friendly, but, um, but the rule is if you're a dog, a big dog fan is you don't touch a dog that you don't know until the owner says it's okay. Like that's in the unsaid dictionary of the very obsessive dog fans. Um, oh, yeah. And, it's yeah. Um, so, so she's got that. And so if she was a human, so if she was a child, so say if you had a child conditioned like that, a child was conditioned that her, her boundaries were crossed unless she was aggressive to people. So in order to have her boundaries respected, she had to be aggressive to people. That would, that would produce a particular personality type and that would produce quite a strong behavioral dynamic that she, she becomes aggressive because she realizes her boundaries are being crossed. Now, what we can do as humans is we can understand that so she can attempt to begin to recondition herself. So that's what, so if she was a human, Khaleesi, like I could speak to her and I try to recondition her now, like, and I try to, she's, she, she's good most of the time. Like she's not, to me, a difficult dog around here, but when I take her out and take her on retreats, it's a bit more difficult. Um, so, so with a human, like she could then attempt to recondition herself that when someone comes to talk to you, it doesn't mean they're necessarily going to try and cross your boundary. So you don't necessarily have to be feisty or standoffish. This is just with people you don't know. So she can learn that she can go to a psychologist and she can learn that about herself. And then she can also see that there was a seeking element that got added on there that, that she began to think that if she got people to stay away from her, she'll get back to home. Whereas Khaleesi doesn't have the seeking element because she's always at home, whereas the human leaves home. So it makes it a more important dynamic. So, so she goes to a psychologist and she begins to learn like, okay, so I don't have to act aggressively, but the natural impulse is to act aggressively. So it's aggressively. So she has to really fight against the, like the, the momentum of the river. Like she has to really fight to try to change that around. And, and more than likely, if she's had a long period of that conditioning, it's going to be a lifelong habit that she's going to be working on. Her, her natural impulse might be to be like, ah, and it's going to be a lifelong habit to try and be friendly to strangers. I have to admit, I'm not the friendliest to strangers. It's a dog-like human. Like I, like I was out with my friend yesterday shopping, and my friend is so sociable to everyone like to the people that like um, do the shopping, like everybody, she talks to everyone and she's really social. And I really like, like even both of us aren't that great of French, but I really like how she interacts with people. And I just can't seem to find the words to think of things to say to strangers. <laughs> I'm like, and I don't actually feel I'm friendly, but I just don't have anything to say. And I tend to be like more withdrawn from people I don't know. So that's a habit. So like you've got a habit as well. And now your next mistake might be that if you fix that habit, you will become enlightenment, enlightened. But who will fix that habit? Who becomes enlightened? It's a habit that plays out in you. Then there can be this extra dynamic of seeking that gets involved that says, if I get love, then I will, if I get love, if I get attention, then I will be at home. So that makes it more intense for the human. Whereas Khaleesi doesn't have that. So as soon as people aren't around, she's happy. She's, she's in herself. She's free. So there's the seeking element. So then you get into this pattern of then thinking, okay, I've got to be perfectly unconditioned. And it's not true. You're, you're so expanded right now. You're so free right now. Even if you've got that sense that people don't like you or I don't like you or the window cleaner doesn't like you.
So I'm getting the strong impression that you don't like me, Lisa. <laughs> I don't know if that's a tendency or just your demeanor, but uh, I, I, I have got to admit that I'm not the friendliest person in the universe. Like I'm not, I'm not unfriendly to people, but I'm, I'm reserved when I meet people. I don't know if it's an English thing, or, but I'm reserved. I'm not somebody that will jump up and throw my arms around you and be really welcoming. I tend to be more like, oh, hello. Yeah. I, uh, well, I, when I lived in England versus like, I, when I lived in London for a year and then I moved straight out to California. It's very much an English thing. Yeah. And, uh, it's very much an English Because, yeah, California, like, yeah, they'll just, they'll just hug you like, yeah. You know, yeah. Um, yeah, I think with the hanging out with international thing, I can see that I'm quite reserved compared to people around me. Yeah. One thing I, I realized in when I was in London is that Americans, we are very loud. Yeah. Uh, compared to Europeans, I don't know what it is, but like if I walk into a bar or a pub, you know, I know exactly where my American friends are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think we, I think we have this perspective on Americans too. Like, I think we think this as well, that America, I think, I don't think we think that they're loud, but I think we think they're larger than life. Yeah. Yeah. Like, there's, really. Yeah, it, there, there's something about the American ethos where it's just, um, that's another thing I, I, I know. It's just the, what kind of the way that we talk about ourselves versus the way Europeans talk about ourselves. There is kind of a, yeah, a larger than life, nothing's impossible. Kind yeah. Of, I don't know. There is something, something there for sure. But. Yeah. You know, um, I had a thought while we were talking, though, the, um, because I feel like the unlovability is very different from uh, a lot of the other tendencies that we were just discussing, because, you know, I feel like the, because, uh, and you, you, you mentioned it earlier, that it does come from a fundamental misconception that love needs to be sought. You yeah, know? yeah, that and that, and that, yeah, that's why it, it most probably comes with strong, very strong seeking tendency. Yeah, that love needs to be something you get for you. Like l love is super important in the human world. Yeah, yeah, that's what you know. Every movie has to have a love element to it. Yeah, and so let so what to, so what does let love represent then? Like, like so what. So in our society, what does it represent if you're loved? Like if somebody loves you. Maybe that's a bit of a hard question. Maybe it was a bit too leading. Like <laughs> we might, that could mean so many things. <laughs> yeah, no, but no, but it's, it's, it's a fair question. It is, I mean, that's, you know, I feel like that's kind of, I, I was actually just talking to my, uh, a friend of mine, um, you know, last night, who she just said, that's like the, the, like, that's a huge vasana for a lot of people, because it is kind of, um, and I agree with her, I think that, yeah, there's, there's just this thing where, you know, if I just get this, if I get loved by another person in a very intimate way, you know, well, forget the enlightenment stuff, like, this is, this is really, you know, this, yeah. is the, this is the happiness that I'm looking for. And I think, I think it's because love doesn't just represent being in love, so the feeling of love, I think it also represents safety and feeling, feeling it's also got this feeling that you won't be kicked out by the group and killed. Like, so if yeah. you have like this intimate relationship with someone or if you're loved, then it means that you're part of the group and part of society and that you've got somebody that you can depend on as well. So not only is it like this, this ecstasy feeling of like being in love and like, like wanting to create children and all these this feeling of connection, it also is this, um, this sense of being a part of the group and not being alone, yeah. like yeah, not so being kicked like, out or abandoned. Yeah, yeah, so it's like a prehistoric, like socio-evolutionary tendency. That, yeah. Um, yeah, for tribal creatures and now we, you know, yeah. it's a sense of, yeah, belonging to that tribe. Yeah, and when you have yeah. kids, you, you know, you belong even more, like it's all tying you in, like it's all family. So there's two different elements to it. There is this natural want that humans have to be loved. Then there's the, then there's the, the, the setup of your body, so the karma of your body. And then there's the seeking that attaches onto it and believes that your freedom is dependent on getting those and fulfilling those. 
that home is connected to those. Huh. You know, I got into um, a lot of Robert Adams recently, and he, he always says stuff to the effect of, you know, like, just kind of let life take care of itself. You just kind of stay as a witness, stay in the silence. And maybe that's why, you know, like, because otherwise you just kind of get stuck in that, yeah, self-improvement. Yeah. Yeah. I think it has to be dealt with to an extent, but I think I think so too as well. It can become an obsession. Yeah. Yeah. And truth be told, I feel like I'm kind of at this place where, like, yeah, I I had to like break down a lot of mind. You know, I think it it was absolutely necessary. But now it's just like. Now it's just the mind just kind of like, yeah, just this one last thing, then you can kind of hang out this freedom, <laughs> this freedom business. Just one last thing, then you can get, then you can, yeah, then you'll really be at peace, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like, yeah, more and more, I, like I see these things come up and I, and, and the direction, you know, the real direction is just, no, just, just, just kind of stay, stay in the stillness, stay in the silence, you know? Yeah. Yeah, even in this moment, like, yeah, the, the unlovability tendency, it's not, I feel like there's just a greater pull towards the silence than, you know, actually digging in and, you know, kind of doing the therapy route. Um, Nice. Maybe I move on now to someone else. It was really lovely speaking with you. You as well. It's always nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thanks for talking. Yeah, thanks, um, Michelle. All right. You take care. Thanks. Bye. Hey Edith, I don't read out your your um your comment, all of your comment. I just read out a bit of it. What you're talking about tonight is just what I need to hear. Your words bring me back to beyond what I think I am. Oh, lots of love, Edith. I think I think about you in this time. Let me know how it goes.
So I think that's all for tonight. I'm off to walk Khaleesi before it gets too dark. Thank you um, so much for all your questions and for sharing. I really appreciate your honesty and your openness and your vulnerability. Don't forget to like the video if you like it. This is something important that Google likes. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, guys. I shall see you Sunday. Bye.